When a model comes into my studio for repair, I spend a long time just looking at it. Over the period of a few days, I revisit the model 20, 30 minutes at a time, and I always manage to pick up some small detail I missed on an earlier exam. Eventually, I begin to form a plan of attack, and I have a pretty clear idea of what has to happen and the order in which I have to do it. I have to say, this was not the case for this model of the steamship John W. Richmond. What started out as a simple clean and repair job turned into a much deeper project, full of history and hundreds of questions and nearly as many possibilities. Now, hopefully, I'll come up with a coherent way of presenting all the facets of this project both having to do with the model and the history of the ship and the history of the model, so that it takes a little less time to watch than it does to read Moby Dick. Let's dive in. Late in the summer of 2020, a new client contacted me and said he had a large antique model of a steamship in need of repair. He sent some photos, I looked them over, and with the confidence of one who knows nothing, said, Hey, no thing. I'll whip this puppy into shape in no time. No, I really didn't say that. But the project did look fairly uncomplicated. So when he arrived at the studio with the model, I clearly saw that it was indeed large, about six feet, in need of a deep cleaning and some repair. Over time, my client found evidence that led him to believe that the model was on display at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair as part of an exhibit by the company that owned the real ship. It was one of three models from that company showing the evolution of steamship design over the prior half century. Our model represented the early part of that, the 1830s. After the fair, we next find the model in the possession of noted marine architect Albert F. Haas. Now, we don't know when he got it, or how it came into his possession, or even how long he kept it. He did have it long enough, however, to take some good quality photos, and you're seeing those photos here courtesy of the Rhode Island Historical Society. From there, we lose track of where the model went for some decades, until it's found hanging from the ceiling of a barn in Massachusetts. And that's where our client found it. An aside, I'm going to be referring to my client a lot. And I really don't like constantly saying my client, my client. So I'm just going to call him Mr. C from now on. Now, back to our story. Mr. C's interest in antiquities ranges far and wide, and from what little I know of him, I can say this. If something sparks his imagination, he jumps in with both feet and up to the neck. So it was with John W. Richmond. All of the research for this project came from Mr. C's dogged detective work. He came across paintings, written accounts, photos of the World's Fair exhibit hall where the model was allegedly displayed. And I have to say allegedly because the model is invisible in this photograph and as far as we know it's the only one that we have. And there was more. There was promotional material from both the fair and the steamship line as well as a few articles about the ship's fate and that of some of her sister ships as well. Now, you have to remember, the second half of the 19th century was basically the beginning of the commercial steamship era, so almost anything these vessels did was considered noteworthy. And he even managed to find and purchase a freight bill issued not long before the ship came to its fiery end in 1943. Without hesitation, he dove into digital rabbit holes where even strong men dared not go. And it seemed the more he uncovered about this model's story, 
the more unanswerable questions it produced. Now, the model itself was no slouch in providing half-clues and hints at greater secrets. On the hull, just behind one of the paddle wheels, we found names and a partial date. Further along the hull, more markings, these more neatly painted than the others, but no less cryptic. Is this a mathematical equation? Perhaps using Morse code instead of letters and numbers? If so, the translation, because I tried, doesn't make sense. But if anybody's got a hint, I'm willing to listen. And this, any guesses here? There was a slip of paper folded in four and stuffed through the unglazed window of the engine deck house. Clearly written in pencil, F. A. Williamson, March 11 slash nine, and then nothing. That all important last digit, the one that would definitely date the model was missing. There used to be something there, but it looks like somebody deliberately scratched it out just to throw a spanner in our works. And there were other curiosities too, but I'll save those for later. Now up to this point, everything I've mentioned is before I've done a single thing to the model itself. So much for the idea of a simple clean and repair. It was clear that this project could easily evolve or devolve down to the molecular level. There were many glue line fractures along the hull. Wooden components that may have once fitted well have shrunk noticeably. And I still have questions as to the originality of much of the paint. You get the idea. I asked Mr. C what it was he was hoping to see from this repair. And basically, he wanted to have a model in stable condition, had the obviously missing elements replaced, and that it look its age with as much of the original work as possible preserved. He did specify that when it came time to replace the flag staves, and I did have to replace both of them, that I didn't make the one at the stern as tall as it appears in the Haas photos but more the way it looks in the paintings. Now, this was a decision I was not personally comfortable with. After all, we have hard photographic proof of the original builder's intent, and we are knowingly overriding that. On the other hand, the client is the one who's gonna be looking at this model every day, and within reason, it should appear the way he or she wants it. Another aside, if you will. During the course of this video, I'm going to refer to the flag staves as staff or staves or staves, poles, flag poles, or masts. I'm using them all interchangeably. And when I use any one of them, I'm only referring to these two parts. So no need to comment below that I've used the wrong term or I've mispronounced it. Now we all know to what I refer. Another aspect that always enters into any restoration is cost. Very few clients have the wherewithal to give the restorer carte blanche. And if I'm being totally honest, there are very few models that are actually worthy of that level of attention, either monetarily or historically. So priorities have to be set. That will reflect a balance of the aesthetic and the structural. Now, in the case of this aft flagstaff, since the part is new, it would be no great loss if at some point in the future, another restorer decided to make the model look more like it does in the photographs. Now, you may be asking, how would he know in the future what the model looked like in the photograph? That's because the photographs, all the documentation, including this video, will travel with the model from now on. Before I could really start to clean the model, there were a couple of things I had to remove. One was the stub of the forward flagstaff, and the other was the main skylight. That was a piece I was really hoping to save, 
but it was just too badly damaged, especially on the starboard side, to be reused. I was able to reuse some of the original mica, though, to reglaze the new skylight. So I had that going for me, which was nice. Removing the broken stub was fairly uncomplicated. I just picked a drill size I knew to be undersized and drilled the first hole. Then I cleaned it up and centered it with the second bit of the correct size. Now with that broken piece out of the way, I now had an unobstructed access to the stem head, which made cleaning a whole lot easier. Now removing the skylight was a bit more stressful. The brass railings you saw in the earlier photograph had to come off first. I didn't film it, but it wasn't difficult. Uh, the stanchions were all just driven into holes in the deck, and the whole piece would come off by just being pried out completely intact. The skylight itself was firmly attached to the deck and took quite a bit of gentle persuasion before it would come loose. This piece, like the windows I'll describe in a minute or two, are made from cardstock, very brittle cardstock. Attacking them with a chisel, I had to be extremely careful with my use of force. Now, with that nice big opening in the deck, how could I resist taking a peek inside? My imagination started to run wild. What would I find? Did the builder fit out the salons? Would there be a hidden document signed and dated describing the building process and why the model was built? Nah. It was just a vast, empty space full of dust and cobwebs. But they do look kind of cool. You can almost think you're on a real abandoned ship, poking around somewhere where you don't belong. Now, coming back into the light, we start to clean the model. Now, not only was cleaning this model a big job because it was so big, but there were layers and layers of dirt, and they seemed to have become one with the paint. After an initial dusting and vacuuming of all the loose stuff came the first round of cleaning. For this, I used a mild vegetable-based soap diluted in water. I applied it with a large paintbrush and then I had to rinse everything with another clean paintbrush and clean water. Then everything got dried off with a cotton rag. Now for the next round of cleaning, I switched to cotton swabs and used the enzyme method now, this was a bit easier in that it didn't require rinsing and drying, but it was far more tedious because you cover so little ground. And this is also the kind of thing that's best done when you're in a zen-like state, where the enormity of the task of cleaning a six-foot model with a quarter-inch Q-tip is transformed into a pleasant opportunity to refine your powers of focus and intent instead of being just totally nuts. And as the layers of dirt came off and the paint was revealed, I began to wonder if the paint I was now seeing was the original. I had removed the awning that covers the aft sun deck for two reasons. One, there was a crack in the forward end of that awning that I wanted to fix. And two, I wanted to clean the sun deck. Once it was clean, I was left looking at a very thin coat of gray paint, badly applied, not at all covering a layer of white paint beneath. The question that immediately sprang to mind was, was this section of the model originally white and the gray paint that dominates this area of the model a later overpainting? Or, because the deck was covered by the awning and hence low visibility, did they just decide to skimp on the paint job and the white paint that I was looking at was just a primer. 
it would make sense that they might skimp a bit on the hidden areas. After all, this was the age of oil-based paints, and each coat could take a whole day to dry. So the builder or builders may not have had the luxury of applying a first-rate paint job to every part of the model. Just one more of the questions that we will probably never have an answer to, but I'm beginning to have some thoughts on that, which, if I remember, I'll address later. And if I don't, then you won't have to listen to me bloviate about it. Oh yeah, here's another fun facet in the model's story. Any theories on how this got here? Having trouble identifying it? It's chewing gum. Yeah, I left it there. I knew that the one thing that would likely take the most time would be dealing with these warped and degraded windows. There were 27 of them and two large doors, and only about two or three were actually sound enough to be left completely alone. All the others, including both doors, needed some degree of repair or complete replacement. Now, given the age of the model, I assumed correctly that the glue used was animal hide glue. I was happy about this for many reasons, and here's Tom to tell you why. This is animal hide glue. Now, if you've never heard of it or used it, it's actually made from ground animal hide, mostly cow and horse hide. There are other animal glues, and they've been around for literally centuries and centuries, maybe even millennia. Um, rabbit skin glue comes to mind, fish glue comes to mind, but this is what was generally used in most furniture construction, and it, these glues are really have a lot of advantages. As old as they are, they have a lot of advantages over a lot of modern adhesives. For one thing, it's water soluble. You mix this with water at about 145 degrees or so, and it doesn't have to be precise, but around there is optimal. And you can control the viscosity of it. You can make it as thin or as thick as you need it. Generally, I use it about the way you see it here. Kind of trippy, but not too trippy. It's not very forgiving of bad joinery. That's a disadvantage, but only a small one, because your joints should be tight and well-fitting to begin with. Another advantage is that it's reversible. If you glue two things together and you misalign them, you can actually take the joint apart with a little bit of warm water. You can reactivate the glue, it will separate, you can realign it the way you need to, and then you can put it where you want it. Try doing that with Elmer's or Titebond. Not going to happen. The worst thing about it, like I said, is you have to keep it at a specific temperature, or a temperature range. And the best thing I find for that is one of these electric glue pots. Now, I was using this stuff constantly back in the day when I was restoring antiques. So this was the glue I used every day, and it made sense to have one of these. If you're only going to use this stuff once or twice every decade, you could do the same thing with a glass jar, warm water, the glue, and then put the jar in some simmering water in a small pot. And there you go. I also assumed, incorrectly, that the windows were just glued in place. They were not. And if I thought about this in the way I should, that is, putting myself in the position of the original builder, I would have realized I would need some way to keep the windows in place while the glue dried. Because of the physical realities of this area of the model, clamps wouldn't have been an option, unless the sun deck was not installed. In that case, he could have easily used clamps, and there would have been no need to tack the windows up. 
but they were attacked, so the sun deck had to be there. And it's interesting to note his method. He didn't just make the windows, slap some glue on the back, and tack them in place. Each window was made of three components. The glazing, which was mica, the inner frame, which was made of cardstock. Now, this piece also had the mullions cut into it. And the third, or outer frame, which uh, I failed to get a picture of, was glued over this, covering the nail heads. Now, wherever I could, I tried to save as many of the original windows as possible, but most were too distorted to go back into shape. I think I was successful with two of them, or they were too brittle to stand the removal process. Others were okay except for the mica glazing, but the majority of those that were actually removed had to be made new. Now, as I mentioned, there are 27 windows, and with so many windows to be made over completely, I had to find a way to do this not so much quickly, but efficiently. And the first step in the process was arriving at the right material to use. Getting mica to replace the glazing was no problem at all. I thought that was going to be a tough one. The original frames were made of cardstock roughly 25 thousandths of an inch thick. That might be a problem. Everything I had was either too thick or too thin. And I wanted to make the new frames out of acid-free board. And this was the too thick stuff I mentioned. And by about 15 to 20 thousandths. So... I ran it through my thickness sander until I got what I needed. Now there were two sizes of windows. The larger ones were about an inch and five sixteenths square and the smaller ones about one inch by an inch and a quarter, more or less. There were small variances between them, but this I attribute to cutting and measuring inaccuracies during building. Bound to happen when you've got to make 58 of the same thing all by hand. I decided I would standardize things a bit and took the cardstock over to the table saw and cut all the blanks out to a uniform size. The next issue was how to easily and consistently cut out the four window lights in each blank. I tried using a scalpel blade, but the blade was too thin, had too much flex. Next I tried a number 11 X-Acto blade, but that too yielded inconsistent results, so that was also a fail. Then I got the idea to make a custom cutting tool from a single-edged razor. I would need two tools for each sized window, one for the length and one for the width, and each of the tools would have a small notch right in the center of the cutting surface that would ultimately create the mullions. It cuts work! Moving on. I thought I would only need two sets, one for each size window, but I wound up making a complete set for each of the two doors as well because their windows were significantly different from the 27. And worse, they were slightly different from one another, both in layout and size. So in the end, I made way more of these things than I ever imagined. And truthfully, I never regretted making a single one. They were a fairly painless and oddly satisfying solution to what could have been a vexing problem. With the cutting tools made and a mercifully shallow learning curve, I could now knock out new window components in about six or seven minutes. And that takes us to the close of episode one. We still have a lot of ground to cover in episode two. I'll go over glue up and assembly of the windows and you won't want to miss the absurd and also oddly satisfying solution to the reinstallation of said windows. I also have to tell you about an important clue to the model's age hidden behind door number two. 
all that and more hopefully coming soon. So, until I see you again, thanks for watching. And remember to treat each other nicely. Now, break's over. Get back in the shop.